Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show from stricken Aberdeenshire in Scotland, where this week we look at why COVID-19 has impacted first and foremost on Britain's minority communities. In this pandemic, being old or poor or suffering from underlying health conditions has placed people at greater risk. So tragically it has been resident in a care home or being in the front line of the health service or one of the caring professions. But over and above all of these factors, it has become clear that minority communities are also in the COVID front line. Research from Public Health England indicates that across every ethnic grouping, BAME communities have above average suffering from the pandemic. And this week, the UK government came under sustained criticism for delaying the publication of that aspect of the report, which indicated there should be recommendations to tackle this racial imbalance. Explosively, it contains the conclusion that institutionalised racism has contributed to the high death rates. Ministers are accused of suppressing this section of the report for fear of stoking tensions in the heightened international atmosphere following the murder of George Floyd. Government action is too little and far too late, says the dental implant surgeon currently suing the UK health secretary over the death of his father. The research shows that in the Bangladeshi community, people are twice as likely to die from COVID-19 than white British people. A member of the House of Lords is scathing about the government's response. And we speak to the lively centenarian whose fundraising efforts have passed the quarter of a million pounds mark to help people during the COVID crisis. All this coming up later in the show, but first to Glasgow and Tasmina with your tweets, your emails and your messages. Thank you, Alex. We've received over 350 responses from all over the world to our show last week on the ongoing rage in the US following the killing of George Floyd, which featured bereaved mother Darlene Kane, young activist Taylor Ulmer and veteran campaigner Medea Benjamin. Hayden from Trinidad says, Their agenda is no different today, but our position is different. We're not like our forefathers. We know the terrain. Victor from Ghana says, They think we don't see or understand things. Those days are gone. Mary says, I keep hearing people attempting to justify what happened to George Floyd by saying that he was a criminal, but two wrongs do not and never have made a right. Araba from Ghana says, Did he deserve to die for the so-called crime he committed? Peace must prevail this time around. Sami from Ghana says, There is always a time for actions and reaction. This is the time the entire African fraternity has been waiting for. It's time for the hands of equality before the law to work. Floyd is a trigger to put the law to its feet. Andres from Johannesburg says, The criminal was not slain. He resisted arrest and goes on to say it was an accident. Chizomo from Gambia says, Did you watch the same video some of us watched that went viral? Criminal or not, he had the right to be heard in the courts of law. Laverne from St John's in Antigua and Barbuda says, All human lives matter. We did not create lives, so we should not take people's lives away from them. Emma from Zambia says, George needs justice and stop killing black people. Olga from Costa Rica says, sick and tired of all these people. Enough is enough. Let's take our country back in November. Joseph from Nairobi says, we are human. Whether white or black, we are all in the same world. And finally, Norbert from Trinidad and Tobago says, America is imploding. Simple as that. Mr. Navin Talati arrived in the United Kingdom in the 1970s with three pound in his pocket before going on to complete a conversion course in pharmacy at the University of Sunderland. After working at Whittington Hospital, he moved to Dagenham, where he opened Talati Chemists and served the local community for 35 years. Sadly, this April the 18th, he became one of the 42,000 UK victims of COVID-19. His son, Dr. Manesh Taletti, joins me from London. Dr. Taletti, tell me a bit about your dad. Tell me about his life and his work. My father uh, was one of the first pharmacies that opened seven days a week, and he would go out in the evenings and open a shop late at night for emergency prescriptions. So he was known for generations and generations. And um, we've had untold emails and tributes given of a, of a touching story, something that he'd done 
for someone's father, brother, sister, um, and it brings back uh, memories. Uh, he was the heart of the community. So he would use his bicycle to deliver medicines to the elderly. And for him, it was all about the community and serving the community well. And most importantly to me, he was not only my father, but my best friend, a brother, and my mentor. Now, I mean, I tell us a bit about uh, how COVID-19 impacted on your family, because not just yourself, but your pregnant wife, and indeed your mother, uh, were afflicted by the disease. That's, that's correct, Alex. Um, it, it tore through our family, and I would call it a family cluster. And this story probably resonates with so many people across the UK. Um, my wife, my mother, and my father, they're all in the high risk group. And the upsetting part is we caught it very, very early on in March. And, you know, my father unfortunately passed away, but I could have been also at the funeral of my mother and my wife. And you truly only understand when you lose someone um, the morning, every morning, every evening in our house is not the same. It's, it's changed our lives forever. Now, taking on the, the government uh, is no mean feat. Uh, how, how are you going to, to finance uh, taking on the, the big battalions in a, a legal action? Yeah, we've had a lot of support on uh, crowd justice um, that we're raising funds. Um, and also there's been so many, uh, which you'll see, so many touching stories of families that have you know, lost both parents. And there is a lot of anger. And we're finding a lot of support out there in the community um, uh, for us to bring this legal action against the government, seeking answers not only for me, but also for the other families that have been affected. And you're completely right, um, Alex, it's no mean feat, um, but I am resonant in my determination to get answers and learn from the mistakes that have been made. And what can be achieved, do you believe, through your legal action that wouldn't be discovered in due course at a uh, an inquiry, whether it be a public inquiry or a parliamentary inquiry, what specific advantages are there in a legal action in terms of discovering the truth? We need answers now, and none of this is forthcoming. The government aren't going to have an inquiry. We've asked for this, a petition was sent. They're not having an inquiry. They're not willing. They're saying we're in a pandemic. I totally agree we're in a pandemic, and we need to learn from the lessons now. The academics are asking for this. The scientists are asking for this, and the families are asking for this. Believe it or not, the winter will approach us, and we will be in a position where we could well have a big second wave. And if we haven't learned our lessons now, more and more avoidable deaths will happen. And of the arguments that have made in criticism of government policy, there's the issue of the delay in lockdown, the delay in communicating the the dangers to the public, there is the issue of the lack of protective equipment, and there is the current still running issue uh, of the, the state of the test and trace system. Uh, in your estimation, of these three areas of failure, what has been the, the most damning? I think the testing. You know, we British people are with, you know, we're all in this together, and we want to protect each other. And if they'd conveyed the information, even if they didn't do the lockdown in February, but conveyed the information, it could be in the community and been honest with us. Like so many other government countries have been honest and said, look, it could be in the community. We've not stopped pile PPE. We know it affects, you know, 90% of people that have died have been over 60 with comorbidities. So if they'd been honest to us and said, until we ramp up testing, until we ramp up testing and PPE and all these supplies, we need to protect the most vulnerable in the community. It would have bought us a lot more time. We'd done the lockdown earlier. Then we would have had time to improve our testing trace. The NHS would not have been overburdened in literally weeks where they had not enough PPE, not enough testing even in the, in for hospital staff. So, so many hospital staff were off sick. You know, everything was pressured. Why? Because we let it go in the community untested. So the biggest failure has been not testing in February. Now, Dr. Taletti, you yourself were a Conservative Party candidate in the 2017 election. But would you argue that there's nothing political in, the, in your legal action? That this is about uh, your family and other families seeking to hold ministers of whatever party 
to account? I think it's very important, Alex, to, 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 to make one thing clear. It's not political. COVID doesn't affect the left, the right. It affects everyone. All of us people that have died have been from different political spectrums. But we have a morality here, what is right. And we've got to have contrition. You cannot say you've done the right decisions at the right times. And that's why I'm taking this action, because there have been mistakes. We can clearly see that. And we're not saying that you're going to get things right every time. But there's been epic failure. And there's been so many deaths, like my father's, that could have been avoided. And I think it's very, very important as a nation, we do not make this political. We want to have a solution so no other families, like my family, has to go through the grief, the sorrow. And it doesn't get easier, Alex, all those families. And I think it's very, very important that those lessons are learned now. And why they're learned now is that if I can save a life in the future, then I've achieved my goal. And it's not about, you know, scoring points. It's about saying, where do we go wrong? What can we do better? And how do we prevent this? And we need those answers now, because if we don't have those answers, all those people that don't want a lockdown will have another lockdown. All those lives that are lost will lose more innocent lives. And if I can prevent one avoidable death, then I've done something. And I think many people feel the same. And how did you feel when previous government advisors and some current government advisors indicated recently that if uh, lockdown had been implemented even a week earlier, uh, perhaps up to half of the lives lost could have been saved? I have to agree with them, Alex. The, 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 the evidence is there. The facts are there. Um, we can't run away from the facts. Um, it was in the community. And if lockdown was earlier, we would have saved a lot more lives. You've got to, you know, people forget in March, the first week in March, second week in March, the pubs were packed, the restaurants were packed. And it was in our community. So, and it wasn't that we didn't have the warning bells. We had the warning bells. We saw what was happening in Italy in late February, mid-February. We saw what was happening in Spain. So the warning signs were there. And I think the government advisors, the scientific advisors that have made those facts, if lockdown had occurred earlier, we can argue about the numbers, but we can't argue about the fact would more lives would have been saved. 100% more lives would have been saved. And more families would not have been torn apart. And one thing is very, very clear, Alex, we've got to take ownership of our choices, right or wrong. And I don't think uh, Matt Hancock or the Secretary of State has done that. In other countries, there have been contrition where people have publicly said, look, I've made a mistake. But here we still resonate as, as late as last week saying we did the right things at the right time. And I find that insulting to my family and many, many other families that have lost loved ones. And Dr. Toletti, if you had a message to give today from your family to Health Secretary Matt Hancock to Prime Minister Boris Johnson, what would that message be? The utmost importance is to protect the British citizens. And we're all in this together, but we need to learn from our mistakes now. And if we can learn from the mistakes that we made, then we can save lives going forward. Dr. Toletti from London. Thank you very much indeed for joining me on The Alex Salmon Show. Thank you very much, Alex. Join us after the break where we discuss the government's reaction to the disproportionate instance of COVID-19 among BAME citizens with that champion of the minority communities, Baroness Uden. Welcome back. Health Secretary Matt Hancock has been clear that Black Lives Matter when publishing a report on COVID-19 and the BAME communities. However, the government have come under sustained political fire for not publishing that element of the review which recommended action and talked about institutionalised racism until this week. But lack of action speaks louder than words, say the critics. I, I turn to Baroness Uden, who regularly speaks up for minority communities and defends the interests of women in the House of Lords. Baroness Uden, how concerned are you by the evidence that COVID-19 has had a greater impact among minority communities? I'm deeply concerned and I have been persistently trying to raise this matter in the House. 
there are countless reports on uh, the system and on government shelves, various points uh, over the past decades, uh, which has not been addressed. And so now we come to see that these health inequalities has resulted in terrible outcomes where we have lost thousands and thousands of people, perhaps uh, not needed to do that. I know personally, uh, the, one of the first uh, doctors who uh, died sadly, and my condolences go to all the families who've lost their loved ones. And, uh, you know, of course, we all celebrate the uh, uh, care workers and the NHS workers who have relentlessly, you know, made our lives safer. We know uh, what Professor Fenton has said and others have said, BMA uh, chief have said that there's been a great disproportionality which n need not have happened and could have saved lives. How surprised were you and how concerned that the government seemed to suppress the section of the report from Public Health England which indicated both what solutions, recommendations there could be and also that institutionalised racism could be an aspect of why there was a disproportionate effect on the minority communities. Historically, institutions have always wanted to suppress racism and discrimination, structural and direct and overt and covert. And that has impacted in a huge way the lives of uh, minority communities. After all, they're citizens. You know, OK, I came here as a migrant uh, with my father and my mother and my siblings, but my children and my grandchildren are definitely British citizens. And they have to be taken uh, seriously as uh, uh, members of all communities. And uh, their lives matter. We need to address the health equalities. We need to address employment opportunity, um, you, we need to address uh, housing, we need to therefore address the health outcomes. So yeah, the solutions are out there, we need to listen and government must admit for the first time that there is institutionalized and structural racism and discrimination within all institutions and they need to be addressed. Now the statistics from Public Health England show that the Bangladeshi community is twice as likely to suffer the impact and indeed to die of COVID-19 than the general population certainly compared to white Britons. How shocked were you by that finding? I was deeply shocked and saddened that that is clearly evident. I'm really angry that I know I was involved in the campaign to try and eradicate health inequalities for 40 years, 40 years ago since. And those very, very important factors still are prevalent in our lives. I want to just say one thing. Bangladeshi communities over the these tra terrible tragedies have done immense work to try and take care of the, those who didn't have access to food and uh, access to services by creating, you know, community-generated initiatives I, in a very, very small way. You know, I was working with a couple of women's organization, you know, um, raising funds, raising um, masks and gloves. Uh, and I have to say thank you very much to uh, the Beijing, Beijing Association, you know, Amjad Suleiman and Dr. Safraz and Emma Jong. They all helped me to try and raise some funds to try and assist because this is shown for the first time, the incredible work that goes on in the community. But we can't do it alone. We have to have institutional support and resources, including particularly for women. Because as you know already, Alex, um, over the last uh, 20, 30 years, we've known the Bangladeshi women are the least likely to be in employment. It is not to say that they're not educated. It is not to say that they're not in the um, employment system, but they are at the very low, lower end. And we need to embrace uh, the fact that, you know, we have behaved very badly towards many communities. I, I'm, I'm in parliament, but, you know, I feel equally not able to uh, get the agenda um, in front of uh, ministers and government. So somebody who is in, you know, in their uh, home in one of the flats, how are they going to have voices? You know, we need our voices to be heard very loud and clear, but it's action. No more rhetoric, no more platitude, and no more just saying, okay, another report. Bayane Sutton from London, thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure always. Thank you.
Davro Chowdhury is 100 years young. During Ramadan, he set up on a marathon walk round his communal garden in order to raise money for good causes in Bangladesh and here in the UK. His initial target was £1,000. Now having almost raised 300 times that amount, Dabrol joins me with his son Atik from London. Dabrol Chowdhury, what inspired you to start off on this marathon fundraiser? Oh, the Captain Tom, Sir Tom. Oh, I see, Sir Tom Moore. Yes, absolutely. I see. Dabrol Chowdhury, tell me a bit about what you've been doing to, uh, to raise the money. Uh, I walk uh, 80 meters 100 times and I do walk more than this, but I raise this money in front of my walking. He's basically, Alex, he, my father is uh, walking his communal garden, which is on the ground floor where his flat is. And uh, the idea started because of the coronavirus, which means that my father had to self-isolate uh, about three months ago. And my worry was that when he is self-isolating that he won't have much to do. So this is, was a way of keeping him busy. He approached me, you know, what do you think if I, I walk to raise money for a charity? Because my father's a very giving person. And um, when he started walking, uh, you know, my, my son, he started a Just Giving page. And I said, look, if you can walk up and down the communal garden, then, um, you know, let's put a target of a thousand pounds to raise money for uh, the victims of the coronavirus. And that's how the whole thing started. But within eight hours of actually putting up the page, currently my father has raised, including on the Just Giving page, uh, 280,000 pounds, including the gift aid and other groups who've raised money for this, uh, for this charity. So Dabrol Chowdhury, if I can turn back to you for a second, how many miles have you managed to do so far? I can walk uh, 60 miles in my, at my village. So I was used to it. So I got habit of walking. Then uh, being idly sit. <laughs> my, my dad comes from a very rural part of Bangladesh where it's covered with water. And, uh, you know, to move around, you have to walk quite a long distance. Uh, Dabrol Chowdhury, your first packages, I understand, arrived this week in, in Bangladesh, the packages of aid and assistance. How excited were you to, to see the results of all your efforts? My feeling is fantastic. I've been pleased for this and tears come out from my eyes. <laughs> Alex, I think there's another point and that is that it is going to 26 different charities. So the first part of it was my father's village, but it's going to 26 charities in 50 different countries, including the UK. And finally, Dabrol Chowdhury, do you have any advice, keep fit advice for youngsters such as myself after your experience of this marathon walking? It is very good for my health if I walk and health is the best. That is, if, the, if I keep my health steady, it is for, the, for them, I work for the coronavirus people. So I uh, support the distressed people and needy people. Thank you. I think, uh, you know, my, my, what my dad is saying is that for uh, people who walk and keep fit, and it's very important because my father's 100 years old, that uh, to be able to be mobile, uh, it keeps the fluids in the body going. And my father has actually his own technique in warming up and uh, keeping himself agile. And, you know, he, he likes to, uh, when he's walking, he actually has different steps as well that he uses and keeps himself entertained. And he, uh, you know, uh, he, he's an avid uh, uh, follower of poetry. So he recites poetry as well. And Dabro Shoudhury, do you have a message for the people watching this show all over the world as to what they should be doing during this crisis? My message to them that 
thank them very much and if you have time then you should unite together and you have spare time keep heavy and keep walking and keep your health fit when your health is fit you can speak you can walk you can do anything but united is best best advice united is a very strength this is my message to them dabro chaudhry thank you very much indeed for appearing on the alex salmon show thank you very much alex thank you thank you thank alex, you thank you privet 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 by the middle of may of this year 90% of doctors who died from covid-19 came from britain's bame communities it was hardly a surprise therefore when the government published a report confirming the above average instance of this deadly virus among minority communities what was a surprise is that they delayed publication of an aspect of the report which recommended certain actions uh, and also which indicated that institutionalized racism may be a contributory factor to the problem if the uk government had set out to raise suspicions among ethnic minorities they could hardly have acted with more insensitivity feelings are running high because of covid-19 because of the death of george floyd because of institutionalized racism because of the lockdown but dr manesh taletti is no identical protester he was a conservative candidate in the 2017 election he is rather a grieving son mourning the death of his father just as thousands of other families across the united kingdom are mourning in the country which has the second highest death toll from this deadly virus in the entire world the daily revelations of the impact of a delayed lockdown the inability to protect the elderly the failure to establish an effective test and tracing regime all of these add to the anguish of grieving families some of that anger will be expressed through legal action dr taletti may just be the first example of the coming fury that all four administrations across the uk will have to face as grieving relatives ask the key question of why have so many died in the uk and why were their relatives among the casualties and so from tasmina myself and all at the show it's goodbye for now stay safe we'll see you next week <laughs>